have questions or comments? Okay. Uh, I can just answer them right now. I'm sure if you have questions and other people have questions, then it's good that I've recorded and uploaded. Everyone has access to the. I can't say solution. <laughs> yeah, what's the question? Right. So it basically uh, just resubstitute all the values. Right. Right. So I looked at my uh, my solution, and Q two one, Q one one, and Q two one is supposed to be zero and zero. So that part was not provided in the question. So this is something you need to assume. Yeah, I know. I I gave you the wrong. I went back and looked at the solution. And that's what I've assumed. So, <laughs> empty queues at the beginning. That's right. Yeah. But now you can use the code to generate the the queue values. You don't have to do it manually. You can just use the code. That's fine. Yeah. Doesn't matter. You, you're going to get the same answer. It's a it's a math class, so yes, yes. well, not a math class, but yeah. yeah. And, uh, um, okay. Uh, this is the first question, which is the thing, and then uh, yeah, to modify. Can I can I just show you? Because I don't know how to. Uh, ask the question. <laughs> well, modifying the, the S matrix. The S matrix. Yeah. Is ju uh, uh, already in the code. It was one third. One third. Yeah. You just have to change it to seven ten, two seven, ten, ten, and one ten. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, so in the comprom compromised system, we should see <coughs> an increase in the length of the. Of the That's the right. Cube. That's right. And that means that the system thinks that uh, both queues are jammed, or what? No. So one queue is jammed, okay. because of which the other queue is also increasing, because all the requests are being routed to the second queue. Oh, one of them is falsely jammed, and Correct. the other one is really busy. Okay. That's right. It's busy. Because yeah, because traffic. of all the incoming traffic. Yeah. Yeah, and then there is a if you spoof that signal, then there is a problem because all the traffic is going to Q1, mm -hmm. but Q1 is not serving that traffic because the Q information is not going. The correct Q information is not going to the. Uh -huh. So you have to. Oh no, this is just a change detection problem. There's no. There's no. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah, it's not a sensing. There's no sensing problem. There's no spoofing problem in this problem in this case. You just have to detect an attack. Yeah. There's no spoofing. Yeah. And here we we initiated an attack by just changing the S two how, distribution. Right. That's right. And S two distribution. How how is S two distribution is used in this case? Uh, so the S two distribution is basically how many packets. How many requests are, is that server able to complete within one time step? Able to complete, okay. Right. So, so suppose uh, the server is requested a video, a three-hour-long YouTube movie, like some movie, and a New York Times article, mm -hmm. right? And because of the movie, not because of the movie, but because of the attack, the server is only able to send a very small chunk, like 20 minutes of movie every hour, okay. instead of okay. you know three-hour movie being sent within 10 minutes. Okay. Right? So that's the problem that's happening at the server level because of the attack. Server has become extremely slow because of the attack. 
So before, before S2 was 0, 1, and 2, mm -hmm. that was the normal. That was one third, one third, one third. One third, one third, one third. Yes, right. Yes. Yeah. Which was, okay, if they are all equal, well. So S2 in the pre attack case. S2 was able to serve zero request one third of the time, one request one third of the time, and two requests one third of the time. And after the attack, it's, I don't know what is it, zero, seven over 10, one, two over 10. This is correct? Yeah. Okay. So now, so this was what was happening earlier. Now it's zero majority of the time, and it's one and two very few number of times. Mm. So the number of requests served per time step is significantly low in this case. Right? So if you look at the expected value of S2, this is equal to one. Here, the expected value of S2 is 2, 10, 4 over 10, right? So your server is not able to serve enough number of packets or enough number of requests every time step. It's a significant reduction in the capacity. I mean, arguably, in a data center, you don't have just one server. You have like a whole rack of servers. So what this basically means is there is this whole block of servers that are under attack. They are not able to service the request. So you, all the load is going on to the other servers. And this is what the, there's, they are able to serve. And now we're just manually changing the probabilities in real situations. Correct. Correct. That piece of a That's right. Will be right. By right. So you are just trying to detect that something has changed mm -hmm. in the way servers are able to serve the request. Okay. Any other question? And we are using log likelihood. This is the topic that we are currently discussing in class. So whatever we discussed in the previous class is what you need to apply in this problem. Yeah. Oh, so the next part is what we were Right, what we were discussing in the previous class, and we'll continue that discussion in today's class as well. Any other question? There are, of course, uh, multiple ways by which you can detect anomaly. Log likelihood is just one way. And it has certain desirable properties that it is the fastest. It is known as the quickest change detection algorithm. So if a change happens, this algorithm is able to detect it very quickly. But you can come up with your own change detection algorithm, which may not be quick enough for the application at hand. OK. so. Uh, We'll continue our discussion on uh, uh, change detection from the previous class. And in the last class, we had talked about a post-attack transition probability, I'm sorry, pre-attack transition probability. And then Q is post-attack. transition probability. And you know Q. In this case, in the, the situation that was discussed in the previous class, Q was known. So you know Q because you have carried out that cyber attack on the system, uh, because your supervisor told you to attack the system. And you have collected data, and you have kind of understood that under that attack scenario, this is what the state transition probability is going to look like. And now, uh, you run your hypothesis test, which was discussed in the previous class, the log likelihood
change detection algorithm. And basically, you raise an alarm at time n where no max of greater than or equal to c this was the algorithm where this was the log likelihood sum of log likelihood functions okay now this if you look at this expression, you might feel that this is very complicated because you have to keep track of all the different summations from all the way to 0 to n. So if you think about, let's say, a vehicle which is collecting data every 100 milliseconds, uh, within a matter of 60 minutes, 60 seconds, you are collecting 60 into 10, 600 data points, right? So n in that case, in one minute, n is 600. Typically, some vehicles run for hours. So you can imagine this number, n, is going to be 36,000 and whatever, like some very large number in an hour or two hours. So then the problem is, this, this is, uh, we want to be able to write it in a simpler fashion. We don't want to keep track of these 36,000 36,000 uh, different variables in the memory because it's going to blow up. Blow up in the sense that you won't have enough memory on your embedded device to be able to store those many variables. So there is an easier way to keep track of this number and that's as follows. You define ln L0 equals to 0 and ln plus 1 equals to max ln plus log q xt okay lt plus 1 lt log q xt xt plus 1 over p xt p xt plus no p xt xt plus 1 comma zero. <clears throat> and it turns out that this LT is the same as, or LN is the same as max zero less than K less than N as K to N. Yeah, this is the this is zero, and then L one is con uh, computed using L zero plus Q of x zero x one over P of x zero x one, comma zero, and then you keep track of this real number. Uh, this would be in R. So then it becomes much easier. So now you don't have to store all this stuff in your memory because you're running this system for several hours or several hundreds of hours. All you have to do is keep track of this number. And as soon as this number crosses the threshold C, you raise an alarm, okay? So what does this, this graph looks like? So let me erase this part. And I just want to show you what this graph would look like. You will, of course, plot this in your assignment. So this is my time axis t. And I started operating my system at time 0. And this is my LT. And LT is just a real number. So I can just plot it on this graph. And so LT would look something like this. So it's going to look something like this. And you will have a threshold 
of C here. That's your threshold C. So you can't pick your threshold C to be a small number. That's going to create a problem. So you'll pick a C which is a sufficiently large number. And the attack starts here. And you are able to detect at this point. So this is hard to store in the memory. This is very easy to store in the memory. Checking whether this number is greater than C or not is very easy. It's uh, just an if loop. And if you look at the evolution of LT over time, it looks something like this. So it is close to zero most of the time. <coughs> and then at some point of time, attack starts. And this number starts increasing, LT starts increasing. And then it goes, it exceeds the threshold C at a time. And then you raise the alarm that, hey, look, something is, something is fishy. Something is going wrong. There's an attack happening on the system. Does that make sense? Now, this is when the false alarm would happen. So you are doing something like this. This is what LT is looking like. I mean, this is what LT looks like. This is another sample path. And so it crosses the threshold C, but it's not really uh, an attack. It's just the way randomness has evolved over a very short period of time when it exceeds the threshold. So the way to reduce false alarm is you pick the threshold very high. The C can be very high. So then the, this particular curve will not cross C with very high probability, but then the detection will happen after a very long time, right? So let me increase the value of C. So now this is my LT. And I have picked a very large value of C. C prime. It's a very large value of C. But now the attack starts here but the detection is going to happen at this time. This is the detection time. So you see there is a, this is the detection delay. Right, so there is a natural trade-off, natural tension between false alarm rate and the detection delay that you are going to see in the system. Any questions so far? So small c detects much quicker, but then you also have a high false alarm rate. Uh, large value of c, uh, you will have very little false alarm rate, but the detection delay will be significantly higher. And you always have to have this trade-off. There's no way you can get around it. Any questions on this part? Sorry? So there was L0 equals to 0 and LN plus 1 equals to something. 
and then it was the max of skn is actually equal to ln. That was the part that I erased. So this, this whole thing is equal to ln. So ln greater than or equal to c is same as this particular max stuff. Any other question? Can, can you please explain? I mean, I still don't uh, like last. Uh, how this is too many variables to store, and how L t plus one is right. solving that problem? Yeah. So, so this is S k to. So I have to write down the expression for S k n. Uh, has everyone noted this down? Any questions on this graph? I'll have to erase it. No questions? Okay. So if you look, look at SK to N, this is summation I equals to K to N minus 1 log of Q, X, well, let me put it T, X, T, Q, X, T, X, T plus 1 over P, X, T, X, T plus 1. So, uh, what's happening here is you have to compute this sum and you have to store it in the memory sk to n and then at every point of time you have to compute this max from 0 all the way to n at every point at every time n okay you will have to compute the max of so at time 5 t equals to 5 you will have to have compute max of s 0 5 s 1 5 S25, S35, S45, 55. So you have to compute this max and then you have to check whether this max is greater than or equal to C or not. Okay. okay, so you have to store all of this in the memory. That's what I'm. So this S value can take a zero value, negative value, right? Uh, right, it can take negative values because of this log function. But S0, I think S55 will always be 0 because your summation is empty. So, t, so S55 is t equals to 5 to 5 minus 1, 4. Okay, so the summation is empty, so S55 is always 0. So this max is always greater than or equal to 0. Even though individual terms could be negative, the max is always going to be greater than 0. Does that make sense? Okay. So L T plus one it was max okay, max between this value and zero. Mm -hmm. And this is S K plus one. Right. No? <laughs> so this is this is just a transformation, right? So this is what you are interested in computing. And ln allows you to compute that without keeping track of all these different variables. So lt plus 1 has a somewhat complicated expression. <coughs> Which is the same function, the log function plus lt. Right, exactly. Is it not the, I mean, it's the same thing, right? <coughs> That's exactly what I wrote. It's the yeah. same thing. <laughs> yeah. I've written equal it equals to ln. That's but this is just instead of keeping this. In that's right. Variable, just Correct. This same. Exactly. Oh. Yeah. And that below is. Uh, it's the same n. You get the same n. Either you use this expression or use this expression. You get the same n. Any other question? Okay. 
Now the biggest problem in all of this discussion is you need to know this post attack transition probability matrix, right? So, so I have this, uh, so there are certain attacks that somebody told me can happen on my system. So I need to, uh, I need to, uh, I mean, I can do the simulation or I can figure out, I can write the system equation and I can figure out what the post attack probability looks like. Now in many situations, you also want to be able to have a detector, attack detection, when you don't know what's going to change in the system because the number of attack surfaces in real systems is quite enormous. And you can't really go and and figure out, okay, you know, this is what's going to happen and that is what's going to happen. It's just going to make your life very difficult. You can do it for four or five attacks, but you can't do it for like uh, 100,000 attacks that are possible on the system. So the next topic that we are going to cover is the situation where this Q is unknown. So the pre-attack transition probability, I know it because I have the system that is working normally. The post-attack case, I'm not quite sure what kind of behavior I'm going to see from the system and that is unknown. Now none of this theory is going to work because it requires knowledge of Q and we don't know Q. So what do you think we should do? What do you think we should do? So this was my SKN and it required knowledge of Q. Now I don't know what Q is. What can I do? What would you do? We don't know and we cannot estimate, we cannot like expect. But you have the data, so you can estimate. So the question is, uh, the previous detection algorithm required knowledge of Q, right? Now I don't know what Q is. And the question is, how do you, how can you detect an attack when you don't know what the value of Q is? And remember, Q is a large matrix, right? So how would you detect Q? And the answer is, of course, there in your question, and that is, we will estimate Q using data, and then we will try to compute the log likelihood. So how do you estimate Q? So here is the way to estimate Q. I'm going to write, I'm going to introduce a few notations. So what I'm given is a data x, x0, x1, x2, and so on x1000, x1001, and so on. So I'm given this data, I'm, I'm collecting this data uh, all the time. <clears throat> so from this data, I'm going to create a, <clears throat> a, a few variables. I'm going to estimate a few variables. Number of times xt equals to i xt plus 1 equals to j for a less than equal to t less than equal to b minus 1. And a, b, i equals to number of times xt equals to i
and this is exactly equal to summation n a b i j j equals 1 to whatever the number of states is let me just keep it j okay so here is what i'm going to do i'm going to look at a window this is my x a this is my x b so my my time window is from a to b and i'm going to count it's just a counting process i'm just going to count how many times i have seen i j pair successive states are i j pairs so x t is equal to i x t plus 1 equals to j within this time window a b i'll do the same thing for number of times x t is equal to i which is actually the summation of n i j over all j okay so i get the frequency so now i can compute the frequency of the appearance of i j uh, and and so this is what i'll get as an estimate so i want to estimate this q so q of i j hat is n of a b i j over n of i this is an estimate of q hat <coughs> and i'm going to put this estimate in here and i'm going to make it s hat and q hat okay so <coughs> in this case uh, what we are doing is we are estimating the transition kernel using some elementary statistical tools which is just look at the number of times ij pair appears divided by the number of times i appears and that gives me that gives me probability or some estimate of the probability that xt plus 1 is equal to j given xt equals to i so this is an estimate this is not the exact number but what i do know is as b minus a goes to infinity my q hat ab converges to the actual q or let me write q hat ab converges to the actual q <coughs> So if I let the window go to infinity I will actually converge to the real value of re real uh, matrix q so certainly for large enough values of b minus a uh, this q hat is going to be close to q and therefore this particular log likelihood function should work as intended okay the rest of the detection scheme is exactly the same as the previous one the only issue is that you first have to collect enough data to be able to get this value of q hat so the delay the correct so there is a lot of delay associated with collecting the data and figuring out if there is an attack happening or not so this is not sample efficient this is not quickest detection well it may be quickest detection but for the case where q is unknown right so when things are unknown there's only so much you can do
OK, so there is a data collection process, and then the data processing process. And then you compute the s hat, and then you take the max over all the stuff, and then you compute what the uh, whether an attack is happening or not. Any questions on this part? On the estimation part? Much of the attack detection literature is, it coincides with anomaly detection literature. Uh, and much of anomaly detection literature coincides with change detection literature. So these are all interconnected topics. What we are studying is change detection algorithms. But uh, you can specialize it to attack detection. Under the situation that you know Q, post attack matrix, or you don't know Q. OK. OK, now, uh, if there are no further questions, I'm going to erase this side. Oh, you have a question. Yeah, sure. Please go ahead. I, I and J. Right. Are, are, are the, the, the uh, states. The, the, yeah, like XI and XJ, right. the values of those. Right. That interval. Right. Right, so I look at I look at the temperature every hour. So this is the temperature that turns out 69, 70, 69, 71, 70, 69, 70, right? So this is the actual temperature that I'm measuring. Now I have to map it to the state. So this is state two, this is state three, two, four. 3, 2, 3, right? So this is my x0, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, xx, OK? And now, how many times you have 2, 3 appearing in a successive way? So what is n of? 2, 3, let me write 0 to 6, because I only have 6 data points. So what is n, 2, 3? So I see it once, and then I see it twice. The second time I see it when x5 is 2 and x6 is 3. So this is equal to 2. What is n, 2, 1, 2, 3, 3, right? So I have a estimate of Q hat using these two numbers. Okay, so this is what you are actually measuring from the sensor. Then you have to convert it to the state using the discretization procedure that you may have used. Um, and then once you convert it to state, then you can compute all that stuff and create this matrix. Right. So 2 and 3 is the number of times. So let's look at this. So nij is number of times xt equals to i and xt plus 1 equals to j. So 2, 3 is number of times the first state is 2 and the second state is 3, like the successive state is 3. So I see it once here. This is 2 and 3. And then I see it again 2 and 3. So there are two times when that happened in the interval 0 to 6. We can do the same thing. We can do 3, 2, for instance. So let's do 3, 2. And we want to know 3. So what are these numbers? How many times 3, 2 appears in this sequence? Oh, that also appears twice. So I see it once here, and once it appears here. So this is twice. How many times 3 appears? Oh, that also appears thrice. 1, 2, 3, OK. 
Maybe that's not a good example. Okay, four, uh, four, three, and four. So how many times four, three appears? Just one. How many times four appears? Okay, that's also a very bad example. Anyways, with small number of data set, I can only come up with bad examples. But this is what the, the way to compute uh, different types of NIJ pairs would be. <clears throat> Any other question? You will also notice that applying this algorithm requires a lot of calculations, right? So you have to update every time you, you get new samples, you have to update your Q hat, and then you have to plug it in here, you have to update your S hat, and then you have to take the max of S hat and check whether it's greater than threshold or not. So it's a very uh, computationally intensive process. Um, So one way to avoid this computationally intensive process is as follows. Um, you don't want to do so much computation, so you can use a limited window and you can design your detection strategy according to the limited window uh, process. So you could have a uh, limited window and your detection scheme would be n is equal to minimum n such that max of n minus uh, window length capital T less than equal to k less than equal to n S hat K n greater than or equal to C. So this is the length of the window, capital T Okay, so sometimes it makes sense to not keep track of all these different variables over very long periods of time. So you just want to look at a limited window and you can check whether something has gone bad or everything seems to work normally. Correct, that's right. So everything is straight off and, and that's why you will actually be needed on the job to make those trade offs intelligently. Okay. So there are two important parameters that we need to be worried about and I've already alluded to that. Uh, so there is probability of false alarm and then the uh, what detection delay. So there are two parameters that people generally care about in this class of algorithms. And let me write them. Uh, actually, I want to show it to you by a graph. I'm going to draw, redraw the same graph that I drawed earlier, LT, this is T. So this is a normal condition. And let's say this system was attacked at this time.
and this is what the uh, score LT evolved under attack. So this is under attack. Okay, I'll, I'll let you copy it. So you have a stochastic process LT and you have determined, you have, you have identified a threshold. You have identified a threshold uh, C for your detection. Now what do you notice here? So you have a false alarm, you have a false alarm you have the actual true alarm and you have another false alarm here. So if the system was working as intended, we have three false alarms here, but if there was an attack, there is one true alarm uh, in this particular uh, graph. <clears throat> and there is the attack and there is a detection. And this window is delay. And this window is time between false alarm. There is another false time between false alarm, which is this particular window. Time between false alarm. So I'll write it LT or max S hat K to N. Okay, so we have drawn several things here. So the first thing is you have a lot of false alarm because of the choice of C you have picked. You have false alarms, you have three false alarms here. And if the system was attacked, there was one true alarm here. So whenever you get a true alarm, that is the system is under attack and you're able to detect it, that's called the delay. Okay, so that's the time elapsed when the attack started and when the detection or when the alarm was raised, when the detection happened, okay? So this is the delay. And you want, to del you want the delay to be as small as possible so that you can raise an alarm as soon as an attack happens. But in order to reduce the delay, you have to lower the value of C, in which case you will have more and more false alarms, right? So the two things that people care about is the average value of time between uh, successive false alarms and that is known as mean time mean time between false alarms or m t b f a So this is the time between false alarm, this is the time between false alarm and so on and so forth. And you will take the average value of that 
and that's mean time between false alarms. And then you have mean delay, MD. And this is the average of this delay. So when the attack happens and when the alarm is raised, what's the delay? And what's the average value of that delay? Because delay is a stochastic variable, so you have to talk about the mean. And the same thing happens between TBFA, that's a stochastic variable, so you have to talk about mean. <clears throat> so you have two parameters, mean time between false alarm and mean delay. And if you increase the value of C, this would imply that your mean time between false alarm, what will happen if you increase the value of C? What will happen to mean time between false alarm? What happens if I push the C up? Mean time between false alarm will increase significantly. What about mean delay? Mean delay will also increase. So by controlling this C, which is the threshold, you can control the mean time between false alarm and mean delay. But this increase is not proportional, right? So you can increase the C by a little bit. Maybe this one increases significantly, and this one increases in a very small way. So you have to figure out what the optimal combination is. But ideally, you want the mean time. So in ideal conditions, you want the MTBFA to be equal to infinity, and you want the mean delay to be equal to 0. That would be ideal. So there are no false alarms. Okay. There are no false alarms, and as soon as the attack happens, you are able to detect it. This is truly ideal. This is what we would like to, we would aspire to achieve. But in reality, this is the only control variable you have, which is the threshold. And unfortunately, if you increase the threshold, both of these things increases. And so it's not possible to, like you have to come up with the right trade-off by appropriately picking the value of C. In both situations, in, in the first situation where you knew the value of Q, in the second situation where you don't know the value of Q, these trade-offs always exist, no matter what. And uh, I hope you will make the right choice for your organization. So that's all I have for today. In the next class, we'll talk about the same theory, but for uh, uh, this is for discrete state space. We'll talk about it for the continuous state space setting in the next class. Thank you.